Hello, I wanted to discuss the formula for sample size to detect the difference between two means. So, in research, we are generally interested in detecting differences, for instance, between means of two different, uh, two different means. So, so, we may be looking at differences in gestational age between one select group of women and the population as a whole, or we could look at the differences in some psychological outcome based on a treatment versus a control. So we're always looking for some kind of a difference. Okay, so the we have the null mean and we have the alternative hypothesis mean. So for our null hypothesis we generally say that the means of the two the two groups do not differ. The sample say doesn't like so the sample doesn't differ from the population mean. The alternative is say that it does differ from the population mean. So we have one and two tail variations, etc. But that's just a, your your general type of a hypothesis test. So we have a, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. If we're interested in, we're generally interested in the alternative hypothesis being, including some difference that we're very interested in. For instance, we might want to tell, we might believe that a specific group of women is more likely to have a shorter gestational age. Just that's the weeks of pregnancy before the birth of the, the, the newborn, right? Before the, the birth of the newborn. So we're interested in showing that, for instance, that their uh, gestational age is lower for whatever reason. We have some hypothesis. We're interested in testing. We've been doing some research. We have a program of research where we have some sort of aim, and that, that's consistent with our aim. So the question is, what sample size would we need in order to detect a difference between two means, right, the mean associated with our sample and the population mean. Now notice that I have a mu here for the, the sample, the, the population mean, and I also call it the null mean because it's associated with the null hypothesis being equal to, the, the, null, the null hypothesis being equal to the population mean. And then I have this mu sub a associated with the, the mean of a sample drawn from what we believe could be a different population. So, so we use the mu symbols here. We say mu sub zero, that would be the null mean, and mu sub a would be the alternative hypothesis mean. Right? So if there's no difference between our sample and the population mean, our finding would be consistent, consistent with the null mean being the true mean. If there is a difference, well, then that's what that would be of interest to us. So in our, in that case, our if there's a significant difference, our sample mean would represent a different population as a whole. Okay, so that's why we have this alternative mean. So here's a sketch of a poor sketch of a normal distribution for the sample mean mu and the alternative hypothesis mean mu sub a. Now these differences between these means are important. They're a measure of effect. It's some some measure of effect that we're interested in detecting. What that effect will be will depend on what we read in the literature. So we're, when we're calculating sample size, we generally have a difference in mind, we call it an effect size. But we have some some effect in mind, and we're going to use that effect in calculating our sample size. The larger effect, the effect, the the more power we'll, we will have. Power is the ability to reject the false null hypothesis. Speaking of the false null hypothesis, under this, so we always assume that this null mean is correct, or the null hypothesis is correct. And if the null hypothesis is correct, then the the mean of the sample we've drawn is not going to differ significantly from the population mean. So this would be the correct mean here. So what would be considered to be significant, it would have to be some result that's far away enough from the 
population mean? So the probability of a result being that large or larger would be very small. What is small? Well, it depends. Often we say we select small to be 5% chance. So what does that 5% chance mean? We call that alpha. That's the probability of a type 1 error, the false, a false positive result. So, the, so alpha represents the probability of a false positive result. Right? It's the chance of detecting a value larger than whatever, whatever our critical value is given that our null hypothesis is true. So this critical value is going to be associated with a particular gestational age. So we're going to find a gestational age that we think is distinct enough from the 39-week population mean that we consider it interesting. Right? Interesting in meaning that it's unlikely to have come from our general population. So we have some critical value and the probability associated with a value as large as the critical value or larger in a one-tail test is 5%. In a two-tail test, we'd have to divide this alpha in two so that 2.5% of the values with population values would reside to the right of the of the critical value, oh, excuse me, at the right of the mean and another 2.5% to the left of the mean. Okay, so here in this formula we're using a z value associated with a two tail test, so that's why you have alpha divided by 2. The area beyond this critical value, any value beyond this critical value, or in other words, any sample drawn from a population with a mean of mu sub a beyond this critical value would reject the null hypothesis. So if our null hypothesis is mu sub 0 is equal to mu sub a, any value occurring to the right of our critical value would be consistent with rejecting the null hypothesis because finding a value that's at at C or larger would occur in a two-tail test with alpha of 0.05 less than 5% of the time. So it would be highly unlikely to occur given the null hypothesis is true. Right? So everything to the right of C would reject the null hypothesis, so that's our power. Everything to the left of C here, if it belonged to this population, would fail to reject the null hypothesis because it's below the critical value. That would be a false negative result. So you fail to reject the null when you should have. So that's beta. So beta failing to reject the false null hypothesis and, and its complement is correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis are mutually exclusive results and those are the only two possible results, so their probabilities must sum to 1. So 1 minus beta is equal to power. Right? So if beta is our type 2 error, 1 minus beta is the probability of correctly reje rejecting a false non hypothesis. That's power. Okay, so power is probability of correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis and data is the probability of failing to reject a false null hypothesis when it's false so you should have rejected it. Okay, so what's next? This value C is related to both of our populations, the null and the alternative population. It is the outer boundary of confidence we have, right, of our confidence regions, the outer boundary of our confidence region. When we, if you were to calculate a confidence interval around a population, confidence interval, let's say a 
confidence interval would mean that 95% of the population values would reside between the mean plus or minus whatever the z value is associated with this alpha here, two-tailed, times the standard error of the mean. Right? So the standard error of the mean is the same as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. The sampling distribution of the mean well, that's a sample of all possible, oh, excuse me, that's the, that's the distribution of all possible samples of a particular sample size, right? And the mean of all of those sample means would be the population mean. The standard deviation of all of those sample means would be the standard error of the mean. The standard error of the mean is sigma, standard deviation, population, divided by the square root of the sample size, m. So if we take mu and we add z times the standard error of the mean, we get c. Let's see. For this alternative hypothesis population, we can arrive at c in a similar fashion, we subtract this z value, the lower boundary, but this z value here is associated with, with beta, right? Z value that's associated with the beta times the sigma divided by uh, square standard the square root of the sample size. So it's, so it's this z value associated with power, I should say, multiplied by the standard error of the mean. So both of these equal to C, so we can set these two equal to one another, and we get this following formula, right? We can now shuffle terms around, right, and move both of these z times, well, we can actually add z, the z associated with power times its standard error of the mean to the left side of the equation and move and subtract mu sub zero from both sides. So what we end up having is, and then doing the appropriate adjustments, we'd have z one minus alpha divided by two. So that's the critical value plus this z associated with the with the power, right, and factor out this sigma divided by square root of n, and then we can cancel out the n, so we want to isolate the n, the square root of the n, because we want to ultimately calculate the sample size. And this difference here would be our delta. That's the difference, whatever you want to call it, difference worth detecting, whatever, right? So then the last step would be to divide each side by delta, right? And then we end up with square root of n equal to the summation of these two z values times sigma, standard deviation divided by delta. And of course we want to, we don't want the square root of n, but we want n. I moved n to the left, I just reversed the order here and we squared both sides of this formula, and we get n to equal the summation of these two z squared, sigma squared, divided by this, this, um, this delta squared. So in an example that we had from previously, we had we wanted to detect them, so we're ahead here. Calculate the sample size with a power of 0.9, alpha of 0 0.05, two tail to detect the difference of delta equals 0 0.05. So our z value associated with alpha of 0 0.05, two tail is 196. Our z value associated with a power of 0.9 was 1.28. You can gather all of these from a, a 
z table, we plug these into the formula, right? We knew that our standard deviation was 2, and our difference worth detecting in this case, or, or the dip, our difference there was 0.5. In order to detect a difference of 0.5 with a power of 0.9, we'd have to have 167.9616 as our sample size. We always round that up. Essentially, we need 168 individuals. If we wanted to reduce that sample size, we could, we could do several different things. We could actually increase our alpha if we increased our alpha, our critical value would change. Um, we could also increase our effect size going from 0.5 to something larger, right? Okay, so we could do either of those and we'd actually reduce the sample size needed to get the same power. Or to get, to get, yeah, get that power. Anyway, so I, I hope that helps. I know somebody had asked me about proving this formula, so I guess that's why I did that. But thank you very much. I hope this helped in some way or other.